Hello, I'm Sora Luxon, and this is Magic Lesson number 60, a continuation of last week's lesson. Sometimes helping isn't the most helpful thing. And not in a draconian way, like you should never help others, but what's another way to put this? The lesson of why ceremonial magicians cultivate caring without concern without that stress, that anxiety, that need to involve yourself in being concerned for someone else. Because one of the most fundamental operating principles of all serious occult and magical traditions, whether Buddhist, Luciferian, Wiccan, Hermetic, is that we, as the operators of our craft, can acknowledge not only that we must take responsibility for ourselves, but that doing so is the only way to find a vibratory harmonic balance and progress in our own powers. And that idea, which manifests itself into form, the idea of taking responsibility for ourselves, for our own actions and choices, becoming our own maestro, our master conductor, also means by the very same standard, that we allow others to do the same, that we acknowledge the same potential and right in them to take responsibility for themselves. One way that being ubiquitously, you know, quote unquote, helping or helpful isn't always the most helpful thing to those around us is because it strips others sometimes of their immediate access to learn from whatever lesson is being placed in front of them. Now, I'm not intending to be glib. Each circumstance has its own situational parameters, granted, right? There are many times, many reasons to help other people. That's not what I'm discussing here. And interceding on someone's behalf doesn't imply as well. It doesn't mean that they'll never have the chance to learn from whatever lesson might have just been interrupted by you. In fact, no matter how often you help someone else, until they look into the crucible of self, reflect inward, and seek to help themselves, that same lesson, those same lessons, are going to keep right on representing themselves into that individual's life. Just as Aurora arrives again and again, so do lessons reappear in our lives until we learn from them. And you can't get in the way of that, right? You're not universal law. So you might slow it up a bit, but it's still going to happen. It's very much though like crutches. So when you have a broken leg and you are given crutches by a doctor, right? Can those crutches be useful in the short term? Sure. Do they sometimes help to create a gentler or more comfortable and ambulatory healing experience. Sure, yes, of course they do. But if you're the one on the crutches because you've asked for them and being been given them and you don't stop using them, if you don't set the crutches, the help, again, quote unquote, that help aside, if you don't get rid of it, of them, your leg will remain weak and never become as strong as it could and should be. Even more insightful, perhaps, is recognizing the wisdom and how if you never set the crutches aside or, even more so, never stop being the crutch for someone, if you're ever ready, that helper, to help someone else every time they ask, then they, that other individual that needs to heal and gain strength, they might never be able to figure out that their leg has healed that it's no longer broken. They might never find that out in the first place, that they don't need the help anymore because they're never being given a reason to set the help aside and test putting weight down on their foot. If they aren't given the opportunity to push off from the shoulder that's always there to lean on, they're much less likely to then be confronted with a reason to ever try putting that foot back down on the ground and begin their rightful and wonderful experience of walking on it for themselves again. See, help isn't always helpful. And a lot of the times we think we're helping when we're fighting on someone's side or on their behalf, right? Proactively involving ourselves in that way, fighting someone else's fights for them. 
again, it's, it's the same core principle that isn't always helpful. Generally, this need to engage in being what I'm calling helpful, it's cloaked in a disguise. Because what it really is, is our own egoic selves enjoying the false entitlement of a sense of being needed, which isn't true self-worth or value. It isn't masterful, right? It, it isn't the way. It isn't the craft. Or sometimes, even more commonly, it's our own egos finding ways to vent concern for others in the guise of caring. So it's not actually caring, but instead an anxious concern. And all advanced occultists know, right, that is not only often egoic and self-indulgently egoic in itself, but also simply ridiculous and unwarranted, right? Most of the time, other people don't need us to be concerned for them, especially in instances when they're not concerned for themselves. We know people like this in our lives, right? Very often it's a parent that's conditioned us to this way of thinking, you know, always asking, is something wrong with you? What's wrong with you? How can I help? And you don't need help and nothing is wrong, but you're going to be very convinced that there's a reason to be concerned if someone else near you is always acting that way or presenting their ego in that way to you. A way of allowing our own often insecure internal or subconscious selves to feel more connected is what that often is because we haven't yet evolved enough to be able to know how with great wisdom to express caring, legitimate, authentic, genuine caring for others without having to cloak it in this concern, to have to also act concerned for them, having to pitch in with our own advice, our own aid, our own strength, rather than trusting in someone else's ability to do that for themselves, to make their own choices, choose their own actions, right or wrong, rely on their own strength, their own counsel, their own abilities, their own talents. Like so many of the ego's well-meaning, but ineffably detrimental traits, it's a subtle red flag. It's so well hidden and well-meaningness that it's simple to overlook. But when you really look closely at the need to be helpful to others, because that is what the initiated, the illumined, the light and truth seeker within us does, looks closely with humility and compassion at the self rather than judging others. When you do that within your craft working, then the arrogance of it, of being well-meaning or helpful becomes blindingly obvious. Who am I or you or anyone to say absolutely to anyone else that the universe doesn't have their back to make that assumption or that my intention matters more than the universe's or another individual's or that what they manifest to learn from in all of their right or wrong choices, good or bad experiences, should be or ever really could be interfered with by me, right? By us in any sort of a meaningful way. Existence, beautiful, terrible, ethereal, divine, that's the helper, the teacher, the kismet, the aid to each and every one of us. Success begins in the ritual magician, not with access to the esoteric, but first with the dissolution of the victim mentality. In taking the only non-illusory control that actually can be taken, that actually is available to all of us, control of the self. If you are relying on, requiring, or needful of dependency on others, that isn't control. You aren't in control of yourself, your life, your choices. The people who may or may not choose to help you, they are. They're in control of you. You haven't aggressed yet, 
exited, left, from being caught up in the limiting mechanisms of an alienating social construct. Uh, it's, a, it's a survival mechanism that's ingrained into us. And that will keep you both complacent and dependent on the will of others rather than your own. And it's only through your own will that you will really come into fruition, that you will really see what life and existence is rather than mere survival. The great power of everything you are. That's what we need you to bring forward to all of us, right? You're not going to find that while you're in a victim mentality or dependent on others. And believe me, we need you in this way, friend, in the magical way, as your independent, inspiring self. You are needed. And that great power will never be found or revealed within you, to you, while you're still lacking control of yourself. One of the most consistent, constant questions I receive from soon-to-be neophytes within the order is why are secret societies so secretive, right? Why are you so quiet? Why doesn't anyone talk about all of this if it's so incredible? Why are you still not talking about it even on YouTube in magic lessons that I can go home and do? Because <laughs> it seems like a lot of your lessons have more to do with a self-realization than magic. That is what magic is. That is where it begins. So why don't you talk about it? Because people don't listen. Nine times out of ten, people are incredibly limited by their own internalized belief systems to such a disabling degree that they can't hear anything above their own constant complaint of being a supposed victim of their circumstances. I'll never be smart because my family was too poor to send me to college. Lots of brilliant inventors, creators, men, women never went to college. Um, that's a fact, right? <laughs> and that, that's one definition of smart and not necessarily a necessary definition of smart. I'll never make money because I was born into a bad family, a bad environment, a bad situation. Well, there are well-accomplished millionaires, laureates, uh, Nobel winners, rock stars, whatever you can bring to mind as a measure of fame, power, or success that were set up just as bad or worse than you, that were born into those same circumstances. That's just a fact. It's the truth. Those who choose to do tend to do whether or not everything or anything gets in their way. And sometimes, believe it or not, that includes being born into too much wealth, too much privilege. That's the lesser told story, the other side of the polarized spectrum. Sometimes it's the other end of polarity that might hinder a numinous light along its journey that might get in the way of a greater goal, purpose, or calling. It didn't stop Buddha. Being a prince is what could have sent all of that potential into the depths of oblivion. But instead, he chose another way. Because that is what an authentic cultist does. Chooses free will, control of themselves, of himself in this example. Walking away from the supposed external power that society claimed he had already to find instead authentic internal power. You'll have to excuse my voice a little bit here. There's a lot going on in the world. I've been talking a lot today. Uh, so even my powers of oration <laughs> are starting to break down a little bit. So whether it's claiming you're a victim because of the deck being stacked against you or claiming that the deck is too much in your favor, right? And kept you blind from the pain or suffering in the world. Neither is a valid excuse for not taking action within the self, for not taking control 
and for not acknowledging your responsibility for yourself, that only you are responsible for you. If you aspire to mastery within anything, within the craft, aspire to accept becoming the person who does not willingly cater to a friend's emotional states, whining complaints, or sob stories, right? Is not overwhelmed sometimes by say like a mob mentality. It is possible to care for someone, to hold space and hear them validly, to be with them, to share in their experience without having to show concern for them. You can care without being concerned, without relishing with them and what is really their own weakness, their own unclaimed potential, their victimhood, their innocent but unaware and ignorant self-deprecation that often results in poor choices. Because that's what claiming to be the victim actually is. It's a form of masochism. It's a wonderful way to accept ourselves as small, incapable, unpowerful, unworthy. Which, of course, none of us are. We are worthy. We are valuable. We are capable. We are at the helm of our own ship. Winds arise. How we choose to use them is entirely up to us to turn with them and into them, to chart our course, using them to our advantage, to get to our goals, to fight against them and be buffeted by them, perhaps even having our ship broken up. That is all entirely up to us. Be the occultist who hears the friend blame their situation on whatever and doesn't feel the need to chime in, to get involved, to agree with the victim mentality, to offer help every time, or begin to fight because they want to fight. Real help, the harder type of help to give those we cherish, resides in our silence, in our calm, in our self-control, in our letting another person learn, choose for themselves, make their own decisions. In our saying, I hear you, but I refuse to see you as incapable as you are choosing to see yourself right now. I refuse to see you as powerless as you are defining yourself to be because you aren't small, my friend, and I will not be among the many who engage with seeing you in that way, even if you yourself insist on it. I will not participate in that. It might make me the loneliest light worker, occultist, ceremonial magician, Luciferian, Wiccan, whatever, right? I might feel like I am the only one in an entire room that understands this principle and can take action from this perspective to allow you your own authority of self, right? To say that you can walk without crutches, my friend. You don't need me to agree with you or complain with you. You can get back up and stand. You can and you will and you can do it the right way. Or you won't. You can't and you don't. And that too is your choice and your journey. And I care but I will not stoop to assuming that you can't or won't do those things for yourself or that I have the power to interfere with it. It really isn't that us secret society type people are secretive. I've addressed some of this in earlier lessons. We're simply silent because one, music is nothing to the deaf. (laughs) <laughs> you could play all the concerts you want. If you're playing to a room of people who are deaf, they can't hear that music. And two, our silence as adepts is our highest form of honoring you as the divine existence you are while you speak. 
So even if you think you want us to answer the question, respond by giving you our silence, by allowing you your own hearing. We're honoring you in a way that most people never give you the chance to be honored, right? Notice I mentioned earlier that the inquirer of this very common question, why are you so secretive? Why are cultists so silent about what they do? I said that that inquirer is usually assumed to be neophyte. And usually they are because I answer them with silence. And that silence is the true initiator of their own thoughts, actions. It's the space they almost are never given to think for themselves. And that gets results, right? If I were to answer every question and just talk and, you know, earbeat people, that's the best way to drive people away from their own potential, from their own understanding, and from their own beautiful, brilliant, mysterious methods of inquiry. And people adore being given the chance to find out for themselves because they are almost never given that chance because it feels right. It feels balanced. It feels powerful because it is. Silence enters them and allows the light of self to take hold. And then they want to lunge forward for more of that. If I were to answer every person who came up to me and thought they wanted answers to these questions, they'd very likely not begin the neophyte process because I would have gotten in the way with my well-meaning, oh-so-helpful words. Another example of how the masterful understand that being helpful isn't really helpful at all is when we offer helpful words. We aren't helping, right? We aren't listening. We aren't holding our silence. We aren't demonstrating actual control, the ability to actually hold space. We are not revealing to others our power by example, which is how the best way they'll find to take power for themselves. So why talk, debate, talk over others when you can listen to them? Why agree with someone else's small view of themselves? Why commiserate in their victim mentality? Why fight the fights they want to fight? Why allow our egos to become inflamed? Why bail them out when things go wrong for them? Why judge, blame, and finger point along with them, side by side with them, about everything that doesn't go their way or that they disagree with or that they want to rail against. If you really respected that person, if you really valued them, you take on the much harder task, the labor of stillness, of silence, of refusing to agree with or enable by seemingly empathizing with another person's excuses, whatever they may be, for not recognizing their own power in any circumstance. And that task isn't easy. That's the task, the labor of the occultist. And there's a loneliness there. There is a depth of what our tasking is caught up in that. It's a much harder role to play. To actually respect a friend enough to say to them, to be brave enough to say to them, I love you. And it's because I love you, brother, sister, lover, friend, other individual (laughs) of the divine, that I refuse to agree with how powerless you are defining yourself to be. I refuse to engage in your emotional or psychological reaction states. It isn't anyone else's or anything else's fault. You are strong. You are mighty. You are a co-creator, a manifester. 
only you are in control of you. Genuine magic leaves no room for jumping on the complaint train, either on your own behalf or another's. And that is real respect for someone, a real system of valuing others and oneself. Until next time.